Okay. Oh, okay. you being the one. Yeah, just give me a warning. No, sure. Okay, great. So, so everybody, welcome to the Scottish Clans podcast slash YouTube video. It's going to be on both platforms. I've got Mike Doyle here from Clans and Dynasties. Now, I found him on on YouTube. Now, I was just going to ask you, Mike. Um, I th I swear, because I, I just listened to your, some of your content this morning. Did you mention on there that you also have a podcast? You have two platforms. Um and so uh, we did have, unfortunately, okay. we did have, uh, we decided to uh, take the podcast on, but I am on pretty much every social media format, um, whether it be YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, the podcast um, just would have taken too much time from mm -hmm. myself and my colleague, Philip, um, on top of everything else that we were doing. So um, it is a commitment, a big commitment. So I Praise you, Clint, for you know sticking to it. Um, it doesn't have the benefits of revenue that maybe like YouTube and, and stuff like that would sort of. So um, it definitely uh, shines, uh, you know, and shows how much of a passion you have for this. So uh, hats off to you. <laughs> well, I think I think we're both in the same boat. With ne neither one of us are doing this because we're just making a killing on it. And yeah. yeah. So he's got, Mike's got a full-time job. I got a full-time job outside of this and family commitments and all sorts of things. So I really appreciate you coming on this, Mike, and, and sharing this time with me. I found Mike and I were just getting to know each other a little bit before I pressed record and I found him on YouTube. So for everybody who's, you said you're on all of the social media platforms. Is that under clans and dynasties? Yes. Yeah. It would be under all. Yeah. I just kind of just thought generalizing it. My idea was to, if you, Typed it in, you would. I would be the top hit on some sort of search engine. Um, so I just kind of, you know, just flooded, flooded the uh, the internet with my uh, clans and dynasties uh, name. <laughs> that was my exact idea too. Just everybody like, you got a Scott, you got a podcast? Yeah. What's the name of it? Scottish clans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the CEO would be good. Yeah, you just kind of have to try to get your head above the cloud of everything else that's on there. You know, it's very easy to get lost in the um in the uh, the crowdedness of the internet these days. Um, yeah. And uh, I think when anything gets sort of any traction behind it, um, which Irish and Scottish history tends to wax and wane in that sort of aspect, but um, everyone jumps on the bandwagon and it, it's very easy to get lost in it. So uh, yeah, just flood the internet. If anyone else is thinking yeah. of doing the same thing, just, just flood it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy that your content is that that's what we want to do with it is is flood the internet because I'll I'll just tell everybody else what I was telling Mike earlier before I press record is that. Um, I, I found him on YouTube and I was looking through his different videos and I was, w with the exception of you, you, you dive into Ireland more than I do. It was exactly, and in fact, I even told Mike that if I had found his channel, Clans and Dynasties in 2018, I may not have started my own podcast because I was looking for a podcast about Scottish clans. I'd wrapped up my master's thesis, which I did on Scottish clans. And I was, instead of burning me out on the subject with its all consuming nature for the time that I was working on it, I, uh, I just had more questions. I was, I was more on fire when I finished it than I was when I started it. And I was looking desperately for more content, more things to consume. I had better questions. I knew how to find answers better and I couldn't find a podcast about it. So I just thought I'll just make, make the one I'm trying to find. But then I, you know, a few years later, I found Mike's youtube channel here and i was like whoa <laughs> he's doing individual <laughs> clan histories he's focusing on battles that were fought he's talking about cultural aspects he you know the the difference between an irish and a scottish clan which i do want to to get into here the yeah. uh what were some of the other ones you've you've which clan you're so everybody if you've if you're a return uh, listener or watcher for me you know that recently i did a a set of three podcasts on it wasn't which clans fought at Bannockburn, but I got the idea from Mike's video on that topic, and I think that's the exact title of it, isn't it? Yeah, which clans fought at uh, the Battle of Bannockburn? Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I was listening to that, and I was thinking because as I get, as I get into studying about the different Scottish clans, the Battle of Bannockburn and that the Scottish Wars of Independence—that's a really interesting time period because a lot of clans were just 
they were just starting to, some of them were just forming. <clears throat> and, and so the, my link to the Scottish clans, my strongest link, I should say, I've got a, a couple of different, few different branches of the family tree that go back into there. The Edwardses are Welsh. They came from, from Western Wales over here to, to Utah in the mid 1800s. But the uh, other branches of my family go back to the strongest connection I have is to the McFarlands. And I looked up in the McFarland clan history, they're their own, like probably the, the biggest work on their history by a guy named James McFarland. And they, Parlin, the one they take their name from, he died in, I think, 1309. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the same generation as yeah. Bannock, yeah. Battle Bannock Burnwood, just a bit like what, five years later. Yeah. And so there's not, there's clearly can't be a clan called McFarlane at that time. Now he could have been the leader of a kindred. That's a break off from the Earls of Lennox and a kindred that existed. So there could have been some sort of, but we don't know. Some of them may have been called McGilchrist. Um, there, there may have been a, a something that looked like a clan called McGilchrist earlier than that, but there could not have been a a McFarland clan at the Battle of Bannockburn. There's not enough generations to even get that going yet. Yes. And so I yeah, took it that was, uh, and kind of went with it for a bunch of other clans. It was your video that got me thinking of it. But I, I kind of thought the point of the video was um, not to be definitive um, on the uh because like you said there that's one of the issues the pitfalls of you know that sort of statement of which clan for the bar bomb burn when there's not really a clan that exists but the paternal ancestor may have been in the political mix that was happening and the battle it was to more sort of uh show people um what names were appearing on primary sources around that time um and like say much uh the uh ragman rolls um has many of the clan founder names, you know, people who would actually, you know, call themselves clan side, we'll just use it in the term we sort of know and associate with it now. Um, you know, many of those founders of clans uh, are on those ragman rules um, in 1291 and 1296, I believe the two were done. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can see the sort of the, the roots of these trees sort of, um, you know, being planted. Um, and, uh, well, it, I, I think uh, Robert the Bruce and, um, you know, many of his contemporaries were uh, sort of primary to the rising of clans as political systems. Um, and I think we will touch on that anyway with the Ulster um, and uh, Irish sort of link to Scotland on why that may be. Um, but, yeah, I think he was very much like... Um, Brian Baru gets the um, credit for the finding of surnames in Ireland. Um, it's shrouded in a bit of myth. Um, I think Robert the Bruce owed a bit of credit to the finding of clans, um, or at least the way the political system was sort of happening in the time of, of his reign. Or So, yeah, it's, but that was the initial point of the video, was to give people those sort of names and sort of show them the primary sources that were sort of, or near to the primary sources that were sort of showing these names and areas and um not to be so definitive so if you want to go down and watch it it it's but it's there there's like up to three thousand names on it i'm sorry if i missed any <laughs> yeah well and and, and we'll, let's make sure we I'll, I'll make sure when i'm posting this video that we do include a link to that video in there but i as an audience member to that video i didn't you, you did you, you were very careful not to be definitive in your outlook and you were and that's why i thought the strength of it was was here's the sources you go look for yourself but this is what i found in here and here it is and i, and I think that's very valuable and i tried to, to keep a similar tone like saying hey i'm not the dude that's going to tell you yes or no i'm just looking at when did your clan start usually using your own clans a test you know like what your clan says where they come from and when they started like in that case with the mcfarlands i grabbed that out of their their a book on their history written by one of them and mm. and, and that's when i got you know parlin and that's where i found out 1309 and so but using your own histories could you have been an actual clan by that name at that time mm. yeah and then acknowledging that there were kindreds because i think that's a, that's a that kind of like a a hidden part of the history of the clans especially in scotland I think well, this is one thing that came up with Professor Cathcart with Ali. She said that we're, it kind of just came up that in Ireland and 
and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you're because a lot of the contemporary sources you bring that up, the primary sources, a lot of what we have for Scotland is actually Irish annals. And yeah, you your record keeping was better in Ireland, and we have the list of the, like the records of kindreds farther back than in Scotland. Is that am yeah, I accurate? Um, yeah, so, uh, well, uh, there, uh, there's a caveat to um, the record keeping because uh, a lot of it can be the finding of our sort of record keeping actually can really be traced to Iona. Um, and that's so, you, which is part of modern day Scotland now. So, uh, so who gets credit for that? You know, it's a, it's a bit of a blurry, you know, whose history is the, is the finding of that? Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's, um, we had a far better sort of records um uh keeping and stuff like that. but with that comes when you have all that paperwork with that comes also um the uh problems with editing later um and uh, a bit of uh, uh political maneuvering and rewriting and stuff like that um which uh scotland did get later you know they got the paperwork later but they also got all the experience here, I should give them with uh, how to edit certain trees and stuff like that to, uh, you know, fit certain goals and aspirations. Uh, but yes, uh, fifth century, um, see, clans, uh, it, it, like I said, like Scotland, there's, uh, it's fluid, it's very fluid. Um, it, uh, you've touched on this many times uh, with the fact that we like to put things into simple boxes and say, this is this. Um, and and it's never that simple. Um, we we were very good at keeping our, we managed to put our oral traditions into paper um, before they were lost, basically. Um, and I think Scotland kind of missed that. Um, so you've touched on the um, Earldoms of Moray um, and uh, the Mackie's sort of descent um, and their uh, primary king group, how they sort of appear and the MacIntaggarts, their sort of early primary, the Obelion. Um, and we just don't have a lot of information about them. Um, whereas in Ireland, we had a, a lot of our sort of provinces and kingdoms were named after these groups. Um, a lot of our king groups um were claimed descent from these groups so there was a lot of tradition passed down uh we didn't have the same problem of influence as many influences from other areas as scotland did um you know you had the anglo-saxon northumbrian kingdom going right up to edinburgh um you had the rathonic groups all around you had eventually norse and scandinavia and then you had the sort of i'll say norman very loosely because it was obviously um from all parts of northern europe there uh coming in as well um and people sort of jostling for for these sort of positions whereas ireland didn't really have that because um things like legitimacy were very important and they're very important in scotland too um which again we could touch on but in ireland being uh related to all the king groups was very important to rule in these kingdoms that have been established pretty much from the like late bronze age the pro the provincial kingdoms have sort of been founded in the late bronze age and having this hereditary link to these kings of old was very important uh, which is why brian brew kind of is famous for being this warlord this outlier um who didn't have this great sort of noble blood i mean he was from a, a noble family but it wasn't um say like the enil or the Anokter, um and he managed to you know take over Ireland in its entirety and uh, one of the things he does and he and this emphasizes this point is that he takes Imperator Scotum as his title instead of High King of Ireland because he <coughs> kind of knows he isn't entitled to that kingship that belongs to the Enio. Um So I think there's a lot more importance based on um, king groups in Ireland um, and its uh, and their descendants than than in Scotland. Um, and I think there are many reasons for that. Uh, like I said, immigration, the political system, uh, stuff like that, that um, has kind of made it a little bit of an outlier. That's the, man, you said a lot of things in there. <laughs> that, Sorry. <laughs> that, no, no, that I not not by way of criticism, but by way of wow, we could we could take like, you probably included in that probably eight things that we could take a deep dive in, in it just by itself. Yeah. Um, where, where do we, well, let's, let's see, we had a, everybody, we had a, a, 
a little bit of an outline to go by now. Um, I think if you start from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So Mike and I both felt like we ought to have something that kind of like gives us a baseline and, and, and we're, we don't feel mechanically bound to it, but something to kind of keep yeah. us like if we get find ourselves way out here, we can have something to come back to. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think if we, we could maybe uh, if we start a start on. Um, uh, what was the initial sort of what was the initial point there right, we were trying to if you want well, to. We t talked about maybe the foundation of, I mean, I don't know, maybe a little bit about your background. You're, I, I correctly placed your accent in Northern Ireland. You, as much yeah. personal, whatever you think the, would be good for the audience to know. Well, after listening to that, uh, me going on a wee tangent there, uh, I obviously am Michael and or Mike and uh, uh, go Clans and Dynasties. I was, my accent is, although, Rightly from Northern Ireland, born and bred. I uh, I did actually spend most of my education over in England, um, and uh, then my sort of further education didn't even touch history. Uh, I was in sports science, um, so I kind of, although I was always keenly interested in history, um, I I never really followed it academically. Uh, I then went off and uh, joined the military. And I was uh, in the armed forces for 10 years. Um, and it was in that the armed forces that I met Philip, who is one of my colleagues, um, who I've worked very closely with, um, who then left the military to get his PhD in uh, Irish medieval history. And uh, I sort of ended up working with him in a sort of non-professional way. And then, as I've explained earlier, uh, with yourself, Clint, I ended up into, uh, into doing this whole medieval Irish and Scottish history uh, YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, I kind of had a very broad, and I work in financial banking, so completely non, sort of, uh, nothing ever fits. I kind of bound across, but the one thing that's been consistent in, in my life is uh, is Irish and Scottish history. Come from Northern Ireland, it's, um, Scottish history is very prevalent in, in Ulster, uh, as, long, as well as Irish history. So I have ancestry from both sides as well. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that's kind of what piqued my interest is I find it very political with myself from Northern Ireland during sort of the 90s and early 2000s. And I kind of wanted to sift through that and find out what was at the, the base of it all without having some sort of uh, ethno-nationalistic sort of argument behind it, whether it be British or Irish. I just wanted to look at the real history. Um, and uh, that was where my love of it started from, really. And it's led me down a wonderful path, meeting people like yourself, Clint, and uh, I've worked with some great people, uh, and I continue to do so. So, um, and that's just me in a very short nutshell. <laughs> that was very, very well done, and and I'm happy to put Philip's work and and a lot of that collaborative things that you've done. We'll put links to that in here too, because because I've, in fact, some of my questions that I have for you have come out of those conversations you and Philip have had. So, but you met in the armed forces. I, I, as a guy, I just I just retired from the reserves, army reserves in in June. That's why I can afford to to grow this out. I don't know what the grooming standards <laughs> were in Ireland, but uh... oh no, it's British. We were in the British army, so oh, were you? very okay. strict. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I guess um, I guess I, I I know that politically, Northern Ireland is part of the UK. Um, do they have, is it, is there, are there military, this is a, this a short, I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I'm a military guy and I'm interested. The, do they have it um, broke down by regions? Because we have National Guards here that would go by state and, and they can be placed under federal orders, but they are really a, a territorial type of organization. How, how does that work there? We have our own reserve unit, TA, used to be Territorial Army. Um, and then we have reserves and then you have regular full time soldiers. Um, so TA would sort of they, they work in tandem. They have recruitment areas north of England, Wales. You know, you'd have your Welsh units getting picked from Wales, whether that be the Welsh guards, you know, who guard the Queen or whatever uh, or the King. now. Um, and you have certain regions in England that, and then uh, in Ireland, north and south, even though south isn't obviously linked to the current uh, United Kingdom. Uh, the regiment I joined, the Royal Irish, um, has a specific 
policy to recruit from north and south. Um, so, but you can be from Northern Ireland and you can join a Welsh regiment. You can join a Scottish. It, it's it's not really um, strict. It's just more of a. That's where you'd see the posters saying "Join your local unit," you know, and that, then you'd see that uh, specific cap badge of that unit. But you can go anywhere. Um, so I, I joined the Royal Irish and. Uh, yeah, did eight years as regular. Uh, I didn't do territorial; it was regular. I did eight years, and uh, they were great. But I had children, I married, and uh, I wanted to be home for that. So <laughs> yeah, I totally understand, especially with the, I don't know what yours has been, but our operational tempo has been bonkers for the last. Twenty, it's slowing down now, but um, mm. there was a time period there where, man, you just it was like the meat grinder. Oh yeah, well we work very closely with the Americans. Um, so we're, if you are going anywhere, we tend to be following quite close behind. <laughs> I have I have heard uh, I've had you know heard stories from the guys that I've known that have served with British troops overseas and and uh, they're all I, I never did myself. <laughs> that's funny. Well, and and I I don't think that's much as much of a a tangent as I maybe originally thought it was because a lot of what our discussion with this is is um is of a military nature and I think. Unfortunately, that's well, and, and you've probably heard some of our discussions on our end, both you can see this all over on the Facebook page, but also in a lot of the, the podcast episodes that defining what a clan was. And that definition then has implications farther out than that. Like, I mean, there's some heated debate. I have my side of the story on what did clans exist in the lowlands and, and, but all that kind of goes back and rests on what the definition was to be able to say whether it was or not. And, mm -hmm. and I have my criteria that I've developed after studying this for a while, and people can agree or disagree. But unfortunately, one of the prime areas where you can see kin groups, the, where it's the most obvious that they're acting as a clan is in warfare, mm -hmm. to, to find a feud going on, and I got it. Not every single person in the feud was related to the leader of each side, but that that wasn't true in the Highlands either, and and, and probably not in Ireland. I would imagine there's some territorial lordships that are overlapping and intertwining with the concept of kinship. And uh, but you know, as I look at a kin group and think, was this a clan or not? Finding them involved in a clan, like what looks like a clan feud is one of the, so it's unfortunate that it's in the business of killing each other, but it's one of the easiest ones to find in the historical record, I think. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, you know, uh, what is a clan is definitely, um, it's almost uh, a minefield of a, of a topic. Um, <laughs> and warfare seems to be, but and even with that argument, you have outlier sort of arguments of, well, this branch didn't take part in this one. Um, and I, I kind of I kind of use the example that if they are, if it's at the broader family, um, except the head who claims to be the tarnister or the, the leader, the chief or whatever title they want to use, um, then that's the clan. That's a clan. And you touched it. You asked me before about um, Anglo-Norman families coming in to Ireland um, and sort of were they operating like clans? And I, I think, uh, you know, you have the the, the, the Burgos who became the Burks, um, you have the Fitzgeralds and you have the Butlers. I think they're the three biggest families that, you know, if you're going to look for a generalization, they're the three to, to use as your examples. Um, uh, and with the Fitzgeralds, you have the Northern Kildare Fitzgeralds and you have the Monster Fitzgeralds. Um, and the Northern ones sort of stick to more uh, traditional sort of um, inheritance and politics and links to England, whereas the Monster branches sort of uh, kind of go um, beyond the pale, as the, the old saying used to be, and a, a bit rogue. Um, but ultimately, um, like we said before, clans are that the whole clan system was fluid and it worked around just the politics <clears> of the time. <throat> um, what was in the best interest of the family? So those Fitzgeralds down south would often get their cadet branches who maybe were quite Gaelicized by this point on the fringes of their little kingdom um, and sort of stoke that up and say, we are we're kin, we're related, we're, you know, yada, 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 we're, we're blood. Let's go off and 
kicked the hell out of the uh, McCarthy's. Uh, and then, but at the same time, when it came to succession rights and stuff, and they, you know, the 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 Fitzgerald Moore sort of died, and all those sort of cadet branches were like, here we helped you out in that battle, you know, we're all kin, and suddenly it'd be like, now nah, my eldest son's getting all my land and title, you know, it, you know, it's so it's <laughs> it's it it isn't a, it's never a single whatever argument you present for your argument for what a clan is or something, there's always an argument against it. You, some other family or even the same family 20 years before, 20 years after doing something completely different outside the books, bending the rules. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, like I said, it's a bit of a minefield. <laughs> you know, you, you're, and, and what, basically what I got out of that is it's not tidy and everybody yeah. wants it to be tidy so bad. <laughs> I don't, it's something deep in our DNA that wants this to be, just put everything in its in in order, and I, you know, I did a little bit, and I and I don't think that I've studied this to the extent that the laws of succession. Because going back to your original video that we mentioned at the beginning, with the difference between a Scottish and an Irish clan, a lot of what you went kind of the premise for that was on the terms of succession, and mm -hmm. and so so you studied this a bit. I did I did a, a couple of back to back episodes on, you know. We talk about tonistry, and theoretically mm -hmm. that was used amongst the Highland clans as well. Um, and I, I so I, I dug back and I was like, was it really, or does it look like mm -hmm. primogeniture? Did it, like I was trying to go into, like I, I just take random, like I try to do like a pretty broad sample of. I was trying to stick with the Highland clans to use that as with that with that Gallic. Because it is a Gallic conversation when you come to the subject of ta tonistry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was trying to pick a broad swath of clans to sample, but what I learned when I was checking their their succession, their lines of succession is it seems like it would they actually ended up using primogeniture more. But then, and I think I found this out after I published the episodes, you learn that they they may have doctored some things to make the government happy with the way they su had the succession, like claiming, like for instance, claiming that well, the the guy who under primogeniture should have taken the leadership, but they will claim he's illegitimate, mm. and and they'd adjust their records to make it look like he's illegitimate, where there may have been trying to basically they did whatever they think would be best for the clan, whatever system that was when if it was primogeniture was like look, clearly the oldest son is the best leader and so we're just going to call it primogeniture and go with that because that's the best option or the oldest son is a doofus and we think that it'll end up in a big train wreck as far as clan success is concerned and so his the nephew over here or the younger son or whatever it was he's going to get it and but then they'll doctor the records and make that older son like nah that was like an affair that the chief had and this was their actual <laughs> oldest son, so we're still following. I, I, all I, I think the takeaway image I got in my head was the clan leaders, the the senior members, got together, made a decision, and maybe sometimes the clan chief said, "No, it's going to be this guy," but they could veto. Well, they did have rights of veto, I think. <laughs> see, uh, uh, the the problem is. Um... The clans of the Highlands were, were again, were not homogenous in their their outlook um, in the way they acted, um, and uh, again, so we, I, I think, a really good example is uh, Clan uh, Macdonald. Um, you know, we can see that we know now, especially um, through genetic studies, that they descend from a Norse paternal line, um, but even with them, which I touched on earlier with uh, Robert Bruce and the clan systems and stuff, even then during the 13th and 14th century, even though they descend from Godfrey Proven dynasty, the Emer, um, they actually tried to doctor their records and become more Gaelicized um, and, and came to descend from Godfrey McFerguson of the Erhela. And, you know, they were, there was a real big, from the 11th to the 14th century especially, um, there was a real big push for this re gaelicization this you know Gaelicness of of the highlands um and the the, the mcdonald's were bringing across brehans and you know they weren't really following the brehan law but you know it's look you know look what, look what i've got i've got a brehan um and um you know they were sort of going along these really trying to like 
emphasize is Gaelicness. Um, and uh, for uh, it started with the Dunkel dynasty of Scotland, with their sort of trying to rewrite <laughs> their links to uh, earlier uh, Irish dynasties. Um, and, uh, you know, they've just carried it on and they're, they're, they're trying to legitimize their rule and trying to link themselves to royalty and sort of say how that they are not invaders of the, the Isles, they are the kings. And we know afterwards when they lose the kingship, they still kind of view themselves in that sort of light. They have this sort of wanting to go back and have that back. And, uh, you know, and that all ties in with their con consistently trying to legitimize their argument. So, yeah, there is a... Um, but there's not really, they don't really adopt those sort of rules. Now, uh, sort of succession rules of like the Gelfine, the Delf, uh, the Gelfina, the Delfina, Derfina, sorry, which were like close groups of families that would get together and sort of dictate how the kingship would sort of be and the land would be distributed. Um, happens around the 8th century. We sort of start to see that. By which states the the Gael who are already from Ireland are already in Scotland, um, or 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 the cultural shift is you know so there's been two hundred years, I think it's a very watered down already process that was in Ireland the the proto sort of succession tonistry has gone across as so but I don't think it's really cemented um, in there because of the other groups that they're sort of marrying into, you know, they're, they're, they're very, the, the link between Pictish Brythonic groups and Gael, they're, they're similar. They're more similar than different, um, for the time period. And, uh, I, I don't think they, as much as we use, I see it in a lot of source, not sources, but a lot of commentary afterwards that, oh, they were using Tannistry, they were using Breton Law, they were using, I don't see any real record of it in large enough quantity to justify that it was a regular occurrence like you said it's more likely people were sort of using bits and pieces here and there to justify whatever it was they were trying to do at that time period yeah so so really very similar to what you do see later on is like hey we think this guy's the best option so what system works best for that let's go with it mm -hmm. yeah um, okay you said you, you mentioned a couple things in there i thought were really interesting like I said, every time you, 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 your comments are so good that that there's like several things embedded in there that are you could you could write a thesis on on any one of them. <clears throat> and some of these things are things that I've I've thought about. I put some thought about before, but not I haven't studied all these things. One of the questions I've had in the past, you and I, you just mentioned mentioned this in passing, but you mentioned like the Pict, the Saxon, the Gale, Scandinavians even later more similar than different and one thing mm -hmm. one question i've had for a while is so the assumption is in scotland that the gallic culture as they become dominant over these other groups in scotland that that would have they would have shared this this clan this kin-based society that you can see this cultural continuity with gaelic ireland and you can see it like much earlier in records in Ireland than you can see it in Scotland, but you can see it in Scotland a little bit with Canal Navarine, Canal Lorne, Canal Comgall. What was the Ongasa? Canal Ongasa? Yeah, I don't know yeah, if I'm Ongasa, yeah. I'm, I'm the same. Don't worry. My pronunciation, <laughs> even though I am born and bred here, my Aguilaga uh, is terrible and my Gaelic would be even worse. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's uh, it's something I have strive to improve but it's been patchy at best so uh, i also will apologize in advance for pronunciation <laughs> and i just i just watched well thank you for making me feel better i i did watch just watch a video with the, i think the channel was the fortress of lou yeah another youtube channel and he he actually talked about what would have old irish have sounded like so we might be trying to superimpose the current linguistic rules on on old sounds it was a really interesting video but uh, so the assumption, so we do have those those older Scottish king, and they, they preferred the name Canal instead of Clan, which they, they mm -hmm. use later. And, and my understanding is actually, because it's funny, because when people base their whole idea on Clan being a Gallic thing, and if it's a Clan, it's a Gallic word, so it's a Gallic thing. But even amongst the Gales, I think they transitioned later in the history and started using a something like Kine, Kine, or something like that, for a the in favor of 
uh, in place of clan more in their regular use. Do you know anything about that? No, um, I mean, a, a clan is, you know, it's a, it's a Q, Q Celtic. It comes from planta because there's no P in the, in the yeah. Celtic sort of, uh, sort of uh, um, it's gone to clan. But uh, they, see, the thing is, when in, in Ireland, um, you sort of had these sort of kingdoms uh, but that were sort of using... So you were part of the the name of the tribe was the name of the kingdom. The name of the kingdom was the name of the tribe, um, and it was sort of so they were using that. I am sort of like I am Irish. You are American, you know. I am Kinaloan. I am you know. It, it's not so much uh, that they they are Kinaloan as in the king group that we would know. Um, right. They just they are part of that area. If they even really saw it, the like, uh, nationalistic arguments are kind of hard with the rise of nationalism. Um, Dependent, there's like four arguments, you know, when it found it and stuff. So, um, and I'm getting sidetracked. So, basically, um, how they would have referred to themselves again goes back to sort of where you were and how important your family were. So, the we have the Enil and we have the uh, who then become the Kinloan, who then become another branch of them becomes the O'Neill. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's again, it's constantly moving and it would depend on what sort of area you want to, to look at. Um, and these things don't happen overnight either. They sort of slowly happen over 200 years and it slowly drifts to the other one. And sometimes it reverts back, goes a wee bit conservative, sort of takes a step back and then it goes again. So yeah. it's, it's a continuum to the point where we are now, you know, where you can sort of yeah. you know, say you are. I think I think the way you explained that was it will be very helpful for my based on the discussions that I've been involved in stuff that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. So 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 the going back there though we give the 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 Dalriada the Gales of Dalriada and those those leading kindreds you know they say Canal Lorne went up the Great Glen and so you have some of the leading kindreds like the, even the one that Macbeth came from was it, once again acknowledging that we we don't know if those genealogies like actually they are written to tie in back into those things um but we give the, those gales that credit for expanding that that kin-based society as john bannerman called it all over scotland but but what we don't know what, what i've wondered on is what was the social organization of the picts or the britons of strathclyde were they set up in a similar so, way do you know anything about that well and uh, first up uh, i just want to point your sort of viewers to uh you and campbell would sort of dis dispute that sort of migration yeah. and yeah. he so would sort of argue that, yeah yeah he would sort of say it's, it was more of a micro cultural transition you know sort of mm -hmm. the backwards and forwards from the neolithic times that he yeah. sort of ended up in this pocket of gale and um you know it branch out i read that and then that um, was fascinating yeah um, i true. mean there were, well i i think like a lot of the people me and sort of historians we have at the moment and the, the new stuff coming out genetically and everything i believe most of our historians are sort of there on a lot of points not all the way there and i don't think we ever will ever get all the way there obviously um but he's sort of there and i agree with a lot of his assessments some of his other points i don't agree with um and i watched a lecture by cormac uh, mcsparn dr cormac mcsparn who sort of argues a little bit against uh, uh um you know campbell's sort of points so again it's uh, none of this is and when you read a historian's work none of it's you know there is a little bit of uh you know art sort of a guess but it's it, it's founded they're well founded obviously um so yeah, I just want to point that first. But if we're going off the, the narrative um, of the venerable bead and, you know, the uh, the Irish monks and all this, the, the, the Gaels sort of invaded and sort of spread their culture around, um, we can see that there's sort of some, there must have been something, obviously. Uh, we have like Moray, the early kings of Moray are having to justify their, legitimize their rule through the King of Lorne. Um, Hudson would argue that sort of they be using that to legitimise their rule, and then you have the um, Galpins are sort of trying to legitimise their rule from. Uh, um, I want to say they're from the the Gabran. Um, so, uh, you know, all these sort of justify to justify your kingship in Scotland, you have to have Irish descent. So, um, we can sort of say that that is maybe. You know, there's some truth in the migration, but your initial question, what was the kinship like? Well, what do we know about the pigs? I think we would say like, oh, they're tattooed, they have 
uh, female inheritance. Um, and they spoke, uh, I think, a Brythonic language is, is, is another argument for it. And actually, now we're learning that none of those three probably aren't true. <laughs> um, so uh, Professor Howard Williams argues that there's very little evidence of <coughs> Pictish tattooing. Um, and, uh, we now, I think, they speak a Q Celtic language. And the matrilineal descent seems to have, there may be some basis to it, but Bede's argument is the first one where we so, he sort of mentions it. Um, and, um, you know, coming from the old stories of the Scythians, Scythians coming across, taking Irish wives, going across. We, I'm sure many of your listeners have heard that story. And then Kenneth McAlpin's legitimacy to the throne is based on his female Pictish line, as well as his male, um, you know, Gaelic line. Uh, so he justifies his rule over the Picts with his matrilineal descent. Um, but it doesn't seem that that's happening widespread throughout the Brythonic groups. They are, like the Gaels, very tribal clannish in, you know, proto clans in their wee family groups, working together to sort of pass on the land the best way they can. But we see it even in the North Saxon groups as well. Did Saxons have clans? They're, they're, they're all human history has this tribalness and these clan, whether, you know, whether it be the tribes of North America or, you know, India, they, they work in a very similar way. It's a communal effort for the greater good of the community. Um, but, you know, as well, uh, so the, they're speaking a similar language. It's the same branch. They're working in the same close-knit proto-clan sort of ways. They're dressed in the same, they're trading with the same people. Um, they're getting on with the latest trends, wearing the latest jewellery, coming from southern Britain or, you know, from northern Europe. So they're really, there's not much, if you went from, I think I touched on this with you before an email, if you went on a boat from Ireland and went across to Scotland, um, even if you went around the other side, you wouldn't have felt so alien. It wouldn't have been so different re regardless of, you know, who you were. So do you think we overplay? Once again, going back to our desire to put everything in their in their boxes, do you think we overplay the uh, the distinctiveness sometimes and, and to the expense of the continuity that would have been real. Yeah, I think this has a uh, its roots in especially sort of 18th and 19th century rewriting of history um, on the rise of, you know, sort of uh, nationalism through Europe, uh, in especially in Ireland and Scotland. Where we said, and, you know, this this is a byproduct, especially in Scotland, of the Jacobian, uh, Jacobite rebellion, you know, where it's sort of like, Britain has to legitimize itself at the same time, you know, and sort of emphasize and it tries to get eradicate Gael, you know, the Gael history from Scotland. And then you have the Irish side sort of trying to over enforce it into Scotland. And um, so we kind of have this sort of narrative bit being built around us um, of like very simplified sort of kilts and bagpipes and face paint. And, you know, these are the markers that make you your descent group. Um, and really, when you go back far enough, you know, it, it, you go back to the Bronze Age, you go back to you know, the Yamna sort of coming in, the Bell Beakers coming in, uh, you know, there always there's a continuous migration of ideas and people um, that, uh, and it's all happening on these two little islands, you know, th th it's, we're not worlds apart. To sort of think that they're so different when, like I said to you, I live in a part of Northern Ireland where I can see Scotland. You know, if, if I if I grew my arm muscles a bit bigger, I could probably throw a stone at it. You know, <laughs> so uh, so yeah, it, it and um, so yeah, it's there's more. They're more akin to be alike than than different. Um, uh, and I, again, we have like B trying to sort of push these arguments forward of like you know these are the groups, these are different, but. Like I say, he could have gone north to Scotland and he wouldn't have been seen as dressing weird. He maybe would have sounded weird. Um, but you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't be out of place there, you know. Really interesting so. points. Uh, and just to go back and touch on we mentioned you and Campbell a minute ago and you brought him up. And and uh, I don't know if all the uh, I've read his his paper where he argues but just to for audience members who have not are not familiar with him or his arguments. 
rather than the traditional narrative of because if you just look it up on Wikipedia or any more the more common mainstream history sources, you'll see the traditional narrative of the Fergus Moore MacEric and his and he was a leader of a kingdom in Northern Ireland called Dal Rieda, but he pushed across the channel there and established himself in the Southern Hebrides and, and Argyle. And that's how the Gallic or Gaelic or whatever language Q Celtic part of the Celtic family comes over to Scotland. And they establish that, and then it ends up being the dominant. And then, anyway, um, you and but that Campbell's, is, go ahead. Sorry, but that raises another point because we now also suspect now it's not one hundred percent, but we kind of suspect that the Del Rieda were a uh, christening, a, a Brythonic group, yeah. who manifested their family tree to sort of be more Gaelic, you uh-huh. know, um, because. Uh, the Delphiaga who were who referred themselves as the true Ulstermen, who were the you know, um, we see the Delriada later on adopting this as well to you know we're the true Ulstermen, um, you know, but we know it's a later sort of um, uh, affinity to it. So they they sort of adopt it because whether they knew subconsciously that they were from a Brythonic group. Uh, but, you know, they've come across so effectively in a very basic broad stroke, effectively. They could have come from Scotland, settled in, in North East Ulster, realised the political situation, sidled up to the Neil, tried to be more, you know, with them, said, oh, we're related, wrote a few names in the family tree. Look, I'm related to Nile and Nine Hostages too. And then they've turned around after a couple of, you know, a couple of hundred years with their new Gaelic sort of outlook on life and gone back to Scotland. Um, and then, like I say, the Scots, wouldn't the transition from Gael to, from Pick to Gael would have been so minimal over a, a generations or so, you know, a gradual sort of adoption that, you know, they just... Uh, it wouldn't have been said because there's no records of huge battles of right. you know these cultural battles you know yeah. and we argue that uh, often it maybe it was just the um, elites um, but it could have been in a very simplistic term it could have just been picks coming across turning Gale, going back you know uh, but there's other arguments to that too you know we've been trading with Scotland since the Neolithic time um, so uh, the continuity of passing to and fro you know there's a really good point to one is that um, a lot of the wealthy acts in the Neil, the Flint axes from the Neolithic time came from the Aran Islands in Scotland and during the Bronze Age a lot of the bronze being found in Argyll <laughs> and stuff like that comes from Ireland um, so you know it's the, there is a continuous movement between the two so Edwin's argument is very valid in that point um, that really the pick sort of people would have had just as much influence on the formation of Gaelic culture in 500 BC as the proto Gaels would have done on the, you know, on the picks for their culture to sort of thrive and become what it was. So, like I say, we can't just have this homogenous there, this homogenous confederacy of people that yeah. sort of follow the same rules. Uh, yeah, really. Thank you for, for laying that out for the, for the listeners. So, Gaelic, Gaelic, Q Celtic m- may have may have been adopted by Picts who had settled in Northern Ireland and mm-hmm. had retained their territories and spread the culture back that way, or may have turned around and gone reconquered generations later. Or what was you and you and Campbell's argument was that maybe it was as organic to that part of Scotland that became do- the Scottish part of Dalrieta mm-hmm. as it was to Ireland, like it it. And that the Apidi, yeah. the 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 was it the Apidi that the Ptolemy described? Was it Ptolemy that described them there? That that was a he may have had for his interpreter as he's writing names of tribes down. He may have had a a Briton with him, describing mm-hmm. a group of people, and he uses a P, where the the natives may have used a a a Q or a K or a hard C sound a K, and so that would sh- shape the name of Apidi to something that may have ended up later down the road pronounced more like Yochi, which was a very popular mm-hmm. name in that in that world anyway. Yeah, so the Christian groups, the those sort of Pictish groups were not just in Ulster, they were down in Leinster, they were all over Ireland. Yeah. Um and it just shows that so I yeah, uh, Edwin's you laid it uh, much better than I did there and that 
like I say, the cultural sort of mix between the two groups um, over thousands of years um, sort of created the the Gael. But um, you know, there's uh, there's plenty of arguments for and against, obviously. Um, but it just shows that it's it's not as clear cut uh, as much as we would like to to have it sort of. Um, and these sort of ethno nationalistic arguments that sort of come from it um, don't often help the the, the discussion. But um, it, it just shows that you know, really, we are more connected than we are apart. I, I agree. Yeah, I think also you see that desire for it to be tidy amongst Americans who mm. are looking back at their ancestry and so where do I come from and who do I come? They need something to tack it down. I I, I think that that may be kind of a sometimes a bigger deal amongst us than it is amongst you all who actually still live there. <laughs> um, I I uh, I kind of get it though. I really do. Um, as someone who lived outside of Ireland for for a lot of my formative years, I did pine for this sort of link back to, you know, the mother country, as it were. Um, and I what I but the thing is, I think we have the similar arguments, but more on a grander scale because it's local. Um, we've kind of gone past the clan sort of thing, and we've gone more sort of geographical with these political boundaries. Whereas I feel that Americans know that they can't really get involved in that because it's not really their issue. So where that they they might they've gone down another level back to the the, the base of it, um, which uh, I think is far far more simplistic and actually I wish it was more like that on our side and we didn't sort of uh, get it so deep into it but um well thanks yeah, for I, holding but, it uh, against us <laughs> no I, I I'm a, I'm a I, at the end of the day we for the the history we have we owe America a lot for it too you know that they kept a lot of it alive and revived it and brought it back so so uh you know even even if any Americans out there feel like you know uh they, they may be overburdening some Irishmen or Scottishmen with their, you know, their heritage links. Um, at the end of the day, we owe you a lot too. So, um, <laughs> if it's it's just part of the parcel. But I, I, I for one, love it, and uh, yeah. I always love the questions. Um, and uh, as long as they keep it before the 17th century, I'm sort of happy to sort of happy to answer. <laughs> well, speaking of that, that's a perfect uh, segue into when we talk about the the back back and forth and the cultural continuity. Maybe we could skip past um, – because I did have something in the outline about like, you know, clans in Ireland that were similar to the MacLeods where they they were pretty Gaelic, but they were they were tracing from Vikings. We talked about – we hit on the Normans. We did touch on that. Um, but maybe what you just said is a better lead into a discussion about the Gala Glass. And you have some really mm -hmm. good content on your channel about that subject and the, the back and forth there. Can you – um, can we maybe start with the premise of, can you just give kind of like a nutshell of what a gala glass was, and then we could dive deeper from there? Yeah, so effectively in its basic terms, it was a soldier of fortune. Um, they were born of uh, Hiberno, Gallic, Norse, uh, intermingling that basically formed this elite armored soldier. Um, but I give the Norse the most credit for for their finding. It was, um, you know, um, two two parts Norse, one part Gaelic, one part <laughs> Gael. So, uh, um, yeah, and uh, they came across in large sort of groups um, and were effective, effectively the reason for the halt of the Norman invasion of Ireland. Um, so uh, would be my basic sort of one paragraph on them <laughs> outstanding so let me ask you a question about that when you said it's uh you, you put a little more weight on the norse end of it because in the in a lot the reason i have this question i thought about this for a long time is you see in some of the clan histories like let's just say the the area of lennox where the mcfarlands were and they'll say that yeah during this time period vikings raided through what they're referring to is that time period where hakan needed to establish himself he was being challenged and pushed up against by the the later Canmore dynasty, the Alexander II, and Alexander the Third, they're they're becoming pretty aggressive, and so he feels like he needs to sail over, recruit all of what should be his subjects down through the all through the Hebrides, and by this time we do have 
we do have um, some of these Hebridean clans or Hebridean, I don't know, that we see some <laughs> of those clans developing already. So, but they should have been Norse subjects. He brings them down and they, they eventually have the Battle of Largs. And mm -hmm. so that's a time period. And you'll say that, oh yeah, the Vikings came through. Well, by this time, clearly they're not Vikings. No. Whether it's the guys that he brought from Scandinavia, from Norway with himself, or it's the Gallicized subjects of the Isles there. So we're talking about a time period where maybe, so that's how other people have labeled them. These people from the Isles during the mid 1200s, because that's where we see the beginning of the Galaglass movement, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the earliest, wasn't it, um, wasn't it for, for an O'Connor received a bride and she brought with her fighting men? Was that it? Um, it was definitely the first time record of yes. Galagos as we know them, but there was the battle at Bally, Bally Shannon where we sort of see the first sort of Galagos, proto Galagos sort of coming into Ireland, taking part with the O'Donnells um, uh, fighting against uh, a Norman encroachment. Um, so, you know, the this again ties into the long sort of backwards and forwards um, coming through. But yeah, uh, the uh, O'Connor wedding was definitely the, 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 it's the stamp mark given, you know, start date. Gotcha. So here's my question. Those people that are coming from the Isles during that, those mid 1200 time periods, to what degree do you think they would have seen themselves as Scandinavians versus Gale? Or do you think they distinguish and we're, it's not clear and they're like, yeah, we speak Gaelic, but we are from Scandinavian families that settled here. Do you have you read anything about how they would have seen that? I I haven't in the sense of we again it comes down to how we imagine the early medieval and sort of uh, you know the medieval world how they looked out and sort of viewed you know you've got the church coming in which is trying to sort of homogenize the world the, you know the western world under you know this create this empire effectively you know christian empire um and they're trying to sort of move politics in certain directions to sort of you know they're giving kings le the legitimacy to go to invade other countries and stuff to try and bring him under sphere you know other christian countries um we've got a lot of moving parts effectively uh that can sort of skew how someone may be viewed and i don't think they viewed themselves in such a wide context <laughs> you know i am john i am from this village I am from this family group. Um, and who who's running my country effectively or who's running this kingdom is of very little import to most people. You've got to remember the nobles at the time were like the celebrities of today, a very small number of them, well known, you know, and you would have your sort of, you know, oh, I kind of like this guy, like our politicians, you know, I like this guy because he's a good guy. And then someone else sort of saying, he's not a good guy. I heard he did this to this village, you know. Um, so to have this sort of wide view of, of a country or an ethnic group, I don't feel it, that that really happened um, until a couple, to about two hundred years later, um, uh, with especially in England, it's a good good starting point with the Hundred Years' War and stuff, um, and even then didn't become solidified in England till the Tudor period. So it shows how far nationalism as it grew from those, uh, how far back twelve forty nine was Larks. Um, but um, so it, you know it's a couple of years. So I don't think they have that sort of idea effectively of or identity. Now, but they do have, what they do have is oral traditions and histories and folklore and all these sort of things that come from their mother groups, as it were, you know, and they are listening to what we would sort of generalize as, you know, uh, Scandinavian bedtime stories and night, you know, all these traditions and they're doing these we things that are sort of linked to that ethnic group now um uh, but we know those isles are hibernized you know from the the gall gales um so it, it is a very much a mixture a melting pot of both um which is why i give credit to with you know to to both or or, or all three because i i want to say that the the gale even uh, the um galaxy or even though it's sort of split in the 14th century um you know it, it's it's 
starting to be its own thing. <laughs> gotcha. So maybe you could, uh, th that, thank you for, for unpacking that a little bit. Cause I was th my follow on question at which I think you, you got to was so to, when you say you lean a little bit more for the Norse in that, in that cultural mix, I was going to ask what you meant by that. Is, is that what you, what you just said about like, okay, they're growing up with maybe Scandinavian story folk tales and, or values that are inherited in as much as there was any yeah. difference between the two more from the Scandinavian side or. Yeah. So I give, I just give them credit uh, because uh, primarily the gold gale, you know, would be Viking father, Irish Muller from Dublin, it's ninth century, uh, ninth, 10th century. So, and then sort of spread up to that, then you have, they would be more of the nobility class because even though there would be Brythonic groups in those aisles and other earlier um, Gallic groups in those aisles. Um, the Norse sort of paternal lines of leadership, as it were, the kings, the chiefs and stuff would primarily be Norse, the, the headsheds. I think you would, on the smaller levels, sure, you'd have Gallic and Gaelic sort of um, uh, paternal lines. But for the most part, kings of those little isles and stuff would be Norse. And much like today, we they would follow trends of, you know, whatever the queen of the island is wearing on a arm, if it's the you know, Nordic sort of style, everyone's going to sort of copy along with it, you know, um, regardless of descent. So, the, it, like I say, it was their input into those isles um, is why I give them the, the sort of credit, because we know how the Irish and the, the, uh, the Gaelic and the Pictish were fighting in that time period, and it wasn't until the Norse sort of came in that we got a real surge of um, sort of heavy armored troops and you know all that sort of thing into the house so they they get it for their for their work early on <laughs> and, and so maybe what you're just hitting on right there at the end the uh the way they armored up and i and mm. i in one of your videos that i had watched just recently this morning the the gallo glass are coming in pretty heavy armored uh mm -hmm. chain mail big weapons like pole mm -hmm. axes and and big claymores and and helmets where the people that they joined up with and fight alongside, like the Irish Cairns, were lighter troops. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that, that heavy armor, that heavy infantry aspect was more, it, would you tie, like maybe culturally influenced more by Scandinavia? Yeah, definitely. Um, the whole style of warfare was changed. Even though, you know, you're sort of talking 150 years after sort of the end of the Viking era, yeah. Um, and it, it is a style that has been adopted by a lot of groups in those Isles beforehand. Um, it was definitely introduced into those parts of the Isles by the Vikings. We see that, you know, where the, they, they totally changed the, especially in Ireland, the political system and the military system upside down. Um, we were used to much like a, a lot of... Now, when I talk about Scotland, I'm primarily talking about the Highland areas, mm -hmm. you know, the... The sort of uh, east and south sort of boundaries would have had their own influences that sort of um, and would probably be a discussion on their own. Um, but from definitely from an Isles perspective and uh, an Ireland's perspective, we were in the cattle raiding sort of time of our lives, you know, quick in and out um, economic sort of ideas rather than uh, land ideas, land conquering ideas. And um, yeah. Then the Vikings came in and showed us what real warfare was about. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Normans came in and, uh, and tuned everybody up. Um, <laughs> I think, let me throw in a, another region. I think one, the, the, as we talk about geographical area, areas, especially with the Gal Gale, who, mm. who would have a, a profound inf impact on these Galaglass. And we'll get to talking about maybe specific Galaglass clans. I think maybe some of the listeners would like to dive into mm. certain kindreds that were Galaglass clans and coming from Scotland, but now become very Irish, like the McSweeney's. But before before that, I want to throw in, we get a, a lot of attention to the Hebrides, Western Highlands. Um, I'm, I'm pointing to things on, a, on an imaginary map in front of myself, like... Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I throw into that mix Galloway. And, yes. and you look on a map, if you're looking at a map of Scotland and it, you can see there's a, it's, I mean, it's a very natural direction. It comes through the, the, the highlands and isles, the Western highlands and isles, but it comes right down, flows right into Galloway. And especially for a seafaring people, 
mm -hmm. where the sea is not this big obstacle. It's a highway. Yeah. It, that, and we, I think Galloway gets ignored, even though its very name comes from these people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely do think that. Uh, it does get ignored. Um, I think, again, it uh, maybe comes from trying to simplify the history. Um, and we've got some very distinctive lines. OK, most people would agree they're slightly blurred, but in a general term, we've got these very distinctive lines between the Highlands, the Lowlands, the sort of east of Scotland. And Galloway has has had more sort of of a mixing pot than the most, you know, uh, with the early Welsh Brythonic groups, yeah. then the, the sa close knit to the Saxons, then the Gal the Gales, then the Vikings. You know, they they really have had the biggest mix pot. And actually, you could argue that's why, uh, you know, when it came to the Bruce invasion, um, or not Bruce invasion, but the the Scottish Wars of Independence, why it was so you know, divided as an area compared to sort of other areas um, yeah. because it's it's such a melting pot. <laughs> yeah, and you and I think that would be relevant to people who are listening to this whose last name or names in their family tree would include McDowell, Agnew, McClellan, McCulloch, uh, what are some other, about Kennedy, those, a lot of those families are coming out of this mix in Southwest yeah. Scotland and it's interesting when you, you see these arguments of people basing the fact that clan should only be a highland because clan is Gaelic and it's a Gaelic word and so it's only the Gales. And that's where, like, to, 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 to your point of Galloway's messy. It doesn't fit any of these yeah. molds. And, and it's lowland, but up until, like, the 15, maybe in some places into the 1600s, it, there were, it was, there were still Gaelic-speaking areas and... And uh, you'd have those clans who are who still have Gaelic last names. And anyway, really interesting element to this. If you have anything more to say on that, cool. If not, um, you want to tell us primary Galloglass families and. Well, to say primary would be unfair, um, but there's definitely families that made more of an impact um, to the political landscape of Ireland <laughs> through being Galloglass. Um, but every pretty much every family supply a scottish family supply gallo glass um it was a lucrative business um and these families weren't in the in the mindset of turning away money for fighting basically something they were doing anyway so they may as well get paid for it you know it, it, it kind of they were well established uh you know at raiding and fighting and uh, ireland was a very uh you know had a lot of turmoil there so and a lot of people willing to pay for for people to come and assist with that so every family kind of gets a bit of credit highland family the campbells were doing it um you know uh which is a surprise as people i know um that it, even a family but they were you know they were a gallic family they did partake in all this sort of other things um that were expected and missing out on a an export, your your manpower is an export. This in this in this example, and to miss out on something like that, and to gain the money that you could get from that, would be uh, would be seen as you know you're not really leading the the clan's best interests. But we do have families that um, stood out above these other sort of smaller families, um, and that would be the McSweeney's, the McDonald's. The McSheehy's, um, trying to think of the other ones now off the top of my head. Um, actually, I do have, I did have, I actually wrote the list here <laughs> just to remember them all. There's so many families, they uh, um, often skip my mind. Uh, so, yes, the McRory's, the McNeil's, uh, the McCoy's, McLean's, uh, McCall's, uh, or, or the, the Mackey's. Um, and the McCabe's. So they're the main ones uh, that sort of um, made the biggest impact on, you know, the political landscape of Ireland. But as I said, we have McAllister's, Mac McAteer's, Macaulay's, McFadden's, all sort of taking part in in that. <laughs> so let me, let me just um, ask you about, well, so one note on the Campbells, uh, something I mentioned before is because they operated in lowland circles so adeptly, I think mm -hmm. some people forget 
that the Campbells, and especially the, 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 so you, if you got to take the Earl of Argyle or earlier, the Lord of Laca or whatever his title was at a given time, but then this next level down of leadership that like the taxman, that, that, that level down and, and then everything below that very, very Gallic West Highland as, as anybody was. But they're, um, they're also earlier, I mentioned about families sort of gaelicizing themselves in the 11th to 14th century. And we may have an example of the Campbells doing that themselves with, yes. we now know through genetic, they may be more of a, akin to the sort of personic groups of the area, yes. but they've adopted this Gallic name. They've adopted the Gallic culture very early right. on. They, their, their oral traditions say they descend from the Odunia. So, you know, a yeah. very Gaelic link to um, an Irish mythology. So they're also taking part in, you know, all the right. sort of rewriting. So, uh, yeah, they don't I get the, that I, I was meaning more toward like um, not so much in their origin who they were, but culturally mm. at the time the Gala Glass movement starting to go on and then clear up. So from from the 13th, late, late 13th century, all the way up through the 16th century, what they were. I did um, Stephen Boardman in his book on the Campbells. I, I think it's a series in the earliest one. I don't have all the other ones, but the, the one that will take you the history up to about 1513, which I think was the Battle of Flodden. Um, he, he does make a very strong case. I made a whole episode out of this for the Campbells being of uh, the Britons of Strathclyde, like that was their origins were in that group. So I was meaning more, so I am, and I'm all in on, I think he made it, I, he convinced me that that would be the case. I, I guess I mean, at the time period that the Gala Glass are operating, the Campbells who who often, and I think some of this is McDonald propaganda, get painted as <laughs> like Lowland, you know, like you're a little too cozy with that group, but the Campbells of Craig Nish, I think it may have gone by McDougal to make things more complicated. Um, hmm other branches, Auchenbrecht. These these are all like very West Highland groups and peoples and culturally would have been up to their eyeballs in this mm. in this Gallic culture. But okay, yeah, so go ahead. Oh no, so uh, yeah, I am um, again with the point like said the Campbells and just people just miss understand. Um, you know, like say it happens every generation sort of inputs for whatever the political situation is. Um but yeah uh the Gallagher, like I say, they're going into Ireland, um, and uh, they, those are the, the but they, like I say, the Campbells sort of were just more, you know, in it for the money. Sure. Um, but sure. the, the, I think the McSweeney's kind of are, are the start of the actual wave of settlers, um, of, of Gallagher families really selling in, in Ireland. They're, they're, they're kind of the progenitors of that sort of idea, not through their own making. They didn't come up with this idea all on their own. It was it was a hand forced on them um, for picking the wrong sides in wars. Um, but they very quickly find themselves in Ireland and very shortly afterwards, a lot of other families, the primary ones that I mentioned there, follow afterwards because they realise there's another gap in another market. And everybody that's listening, Mike has a great video on the McSweeney specifically as a clan. Gives the political conditions that developed in Scotland that made it favorable for them to start maybe looking for greener pastures. Yeah. So yeah, gotta, it was, uh, check that out. That's a good. That's a good video. I, I think that was one of the ones I watched just this morning um, as part of the the prep for this. It was really good. <laughs> um, some of these others. So you got so you got the McSweeney's kind of leading the charge. Um, I think a lot of the, the surnames that you mentioned there as you're kind of listing off the different groups, many of them fit under the McDonald umbrella, like McAllister. They were a very early senior cadet branch of the McDonald's. Um, McSorley's later on, uh, probably somehow just, just going off of the name McSorley, probably connected mm -hmm. into either the McDonald's or the McRory's. McRory's being yeah. kin to the McDonald's as well as the McDougal's. Some of these some of these names in that list, um, I am less familiar with them. I've only seen them in connection with learning about the Gala Glass, and maybe some of our listeners might be as well. I wrote a few of them down as you were listing them off. McSheehy's, McCabe's, McColl's. Now, is mm -hmm. McColl, is that, because if you say McDougal in Gaelic, sometimes mm -hmm. it can sound a little bit like McCool. Yeah. 
Um, so again, it's going to be very much like I've associated them with the same line, but many every family basically every surname has multiple origin points. And in Scotland, you even mentioned it there um, just before, uh, where you know families can sort of have a different name, even though they're part of another family. Yeah. It's, so it's uh, I've kind of whenever I've done talks about it, I've kind of assumed them to be the same, but that may be simplification on my part um, because, uh, like I say, every family sort of partook in this. Um, if you had a, a lad, a big, strong lad, and you, there was a fighting season coming up or a contract coming up, likelihood is you would have shipped your boy onto that boat and go off and earn his money. <laughs> when you use the word contract there, as two military guys... <laughs> <laughs> my mind was automatically taken to, you know, some of these civilian contract groups. Like, yeah. hey, we can do it. We can do it for cheaper than what you're doing yeah. it for. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing. You know, I had families trying to undercut, uh, trying to, you know, trying to, all oh, this is a business at the end of the day. And uh, like I say, it's the business of manpower and warfare. And uh, both of which Scotland and the Isles have plenty of. So plenty of experience to sort of, Sent across to Ireland. What about the um? So the Mc you see the name McCoy, which I think is a closer pronunciation to the over here in America. You'll see McKay. You'll see, yeah. And I think in in Galloway and Southwest Scotland, they have some that, that develop into McKee, but and even well, you'll hear over here, you'll hear Mackey. Yes. And, but McCoy, if 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 the original, I think in the north of Scotland, you still hear the Mackay. And that seems like yeah, you can really sorry. hear how McCoy would develop out of that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you're right. It is it is the Mackie, McKay, Mackay, McKee, uh, McHugh is even, because, you know, it comes from A or A E, depending yes. on your pronunciation of the name A, D, you know, so it's, it's one of those names that definitely has multiple origin points, not all descended from the same line. Um, but, um, so that, that is, um, but primarily, uh, I associate them with the, you know, the Northern family, uh, the neighbor. main, yes, yes. So the, I, I associate them with them um, whenever I sort of generalize and talk about it. But again, any branch all the way down the, the whole Western coast uh, would have partook in some way. Um, but l we know ourselves and uh, American, your American audience will be more than familiar how disconnected we are from a lot of our origin routes for each of our specific lines so um it, it's a very hard question to say who and what but yeah. by and large we know that the wealthy big families definitely took part uh, yeah and maybe could have like been at the front of the line for some of those contracts yes yeah well you're going to go for that you're going to go for the because they can put more men on the battlefield. They can put heavier armoured men on the battlefield. You know, so you you'll uh, any contract right there will know. Um, you know, if you're in the oil industry or whatever, and you're you're trying to get your Halliburtons or your you know uh, other sort of big contractors, it's uh, you know you're kind of going to go for the big, the top sort of top tens. Um, you know, it doesn't matter the price. Sometimes you need uh, the 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 big big guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so funny to think of it in terms that that are very familiar to us today, especially if you've served in the, in the military, especially if you've been overseas and seen KBR everywhere, which is a subsidiary yeah. of Halliburton, I believe. But anyway, um, what about? Oh, and I was going to ask you about your last name, Doyle. Is that is mm -hmm. that a some kind of form of Dougal? Yeah. So especially in uh, Ulster, there's a link between Doyles being Dougals. Uh, like it's one of those names. It's a bit like the, it's the Smith of Ireland, um, you know, where it's yeah. there's a lot of translation or the or better actually still for any Scottish listeners is the Mackies that we just discussed. Uh, the Mackies, the McKays, the McCoys, sort of of Ireland. The Doyles is, is very similar. Um, you know, it comes from a Norse word. You know, the way it be Dougal, Dougal, uh, Dougal, Dougal, Doyle. Um, you know, uh. It's, it's 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 etymology is in in Norse um, and uh, but it's meaning dark stranger, dark foreigner. So again, it can imply a gallo glass link through a 
you know, this dark stranger coming in and settling the era or an earlier Viking, although I kind of, Viking surnames is kind of a misnomer because, you know, they didn't have surnames and the normally it, them forming 200 years after, are they really Vikings by the stage, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so, but uh, whether it comes from the dark stranger of a, um, that sort of sense, or, uh, you know, it could even have a Norman aspect to it as well, because uh, anyone can be a dark stranger. So um, there's a, you know, it's, I associated my line uh, specifically, I, I associate my line with um, Gallo Glass, earlier Gallo Glass ancestry, purely because of the location mm. um, and uh, the links of the other names that are found very closely related to mine. Um, like Burn, um, which again is another Norse sort of influence name from Bran and meaning Raven. So, um, you know, it's it, it's sort of like got that wee hot spot in 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 southern Ulster, South County Down. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, but it, again, <clears throat> the, these are the things that, like I said, the links to where those lines are very hard. I know genetic studies um are sort of breaking down some of those barriers, um. But at the minute, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so you, um, uh, when you say you do, like given the lo geographic location, some of these other, you, you do, do tend to, and you were very clear there, you said your line. So you're not trying to speak for all people who have Doyles in their family tree, but um, you specifically, that location, you, you're, are you connecting that in? Would you, when you say you connect that in with the Gala Glass, are you specifically going in with the McDougals? who were also, see that the name McDowell, which some people, if you're looking at this, trying to create your tidy little boxes, there was a McDowell mm. kindred in Southwest Scotland. Yeah. But sometimes you could pronounce the McDougals of Lorne, who would have been pro probably more engaged in this trade than maybe the, I don't know. But mm. yeah, which direction are you going with that? Are you, do you claim like a McSorley lineage? I do, and much to the wife's annoyance, um, you know, I, I kind of said that uh, I used to say when we were watching the Vikings TV series, whenever Ragnar used to come on, he used to say, that's my granddad. Um, <laughs> you know, through the, through the Emer, through uh, Godfrey Croven, the maternal line to the Emer, through, and I follow the link, for, um, you know, uh, of, um, uh, I can't forget his son, but Ragnar's son, one of his sons, um, inverted commas, um, through that line. So, um, yeah, I used to, uh, I'm very much annoying my wife with that statement uh, every time because she thought he was a very handsome man in that TV series. So uh, <laughs> I, used to, I used to say I look a lot like him. Uh, anyone listening on the podcast, I can t assure you I do not. <laughs> similar similar uh, athletic prowess and ferocity in battle. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's the kind of stuff, you know, uh, like I used Arguments are, you know, he's six foot something in real life. I'm foot five foot eight, but I used to tell her it's just the shoes I'm wearing, you know, <laughs> and and the trousers. They, they make me look shorter than I am. But yes, uh, it's it's that, that like, it's that line that I I sort of associate with. But again, um, uh, my genetic line, um, sort of my own personal genetic studies have uh, not yielded such evidence, but um, as of yet, but. I'm I'm not I'm hope not really hopeful. I, I don't mind at the end of the day. Uh I don't think anyone should mind whatever, regardless of whatever results they ever get back. But my the you raise a point there about like why I do it for location. Um one of the reasons like Irish history, I find a lot of people find it very easy to have an association and same with Scottish with these clan lands, um, you know, uh you know, all these ancestral hotspots, shall we say, is that we know that like up until the sort of um, industrial revolution, families didn't really migrate that far. Um, you know, it's like a 15 mile radius. And even then, those industrial revolution only had hotspots. So if you're from industrial towns like Dublin, uh, which became Dublin or, you know, um, Glasgow, okay, that muddies the water a wee bit, you know, because you could be where all McDowell's, both sides of McDowell's would have integrated and just moved to the same street. You're not going to know which line you come from. But by and far, you know, most families are, you know, we can see it in um, census reports that, you know, wherever a family surname is, is, is 
at its highest point is tends to be very close to in and around most ancestral hotspots. So it's normally if you've got a family from court, the Doyle's is a good example. Doyle is found in every sort of county in Ireland or primarily coastal regions, but uh, for most counties. So you can sort of gauge which Doyle line you're from, from which sort of, you know, uh, area your family's from. You're, you know, you're, there's a good chance that you're descended from that specific line. Not a hundred percent chance, but as good a guesswork as any historian can do. No, that, that's really interesting. You talk about where that name occurs most frequent, most frequently is usually in the vicinity of where that family had power generations ago. Mm. I found a website called named.publicprofiler.org. That's the address. It's just called the top of the website it says named, but it allows you to type in a, like I'm going to type in Doyle. And I guess I could screen share this. Um, it, it'll tell you where in the UK specifically it occurs the most frequently. You'll have like, maybe I can share my screen. I've never in any of my videos, I've never shared my. Uh... Yeah, it's on the bottom tab. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. I wonder if my Doyles are there because uh, they don't often appear on maps. Oh, there you go. Ulster. Are, you, are you seeing that? Yep. Yep. That's my hotspot. Right, right there. there in South Ulster. Yep. Right in Southeast Ulster. Yep. And and you can do this with any, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, it can be like, I've done it with the Edwardses and definitely, even though there are, Probably so the funny thing is just this is a little bit of a tangent, but it's kind of funny. My wife, so there's a famous football coach named Lavelle Edwards for BYU. And it's actually my wife's grandma's brother. The, the ah. whole BYU's football stadium is named Lavelle Edwards Stadium. And and that's my, so he's my wife's great uncle, her, her, her grandmother's brother. And they, we had to do, when we started getting serious about our relationship and I learned that, I was like, wow, we need to do a quick family history check. <laughs> <laughs> but her Edwardses came from England. So there were Edwardses. So they didn't even speak the same language when they came over here. But yeah. when they, so there are Edwardses from there, but I actually use this website. And if you type in Edwards, the hotspots for sure in Wales. Now it's not the part of Wales that, that my folks came out of, but, but isn't this a cool thing when you talk about, you can find, I, and I'll include this link in the notes, but you can see where that name and i actually start typing in i've done this before i've typed in a bunch of clan names and just to see where is the numeric hot spot for that today versus where the ancient territory was and in many cases there is a very strong correlation yeah um yeah it, like say we we have we know of records of obviously families moving you've touched on it before in your previous podcast with um you know uh uh building up an area with your own sort of um kin groups to gain control uh we know of um time migrations we know from from certain things you know whether it be the cromwellian sort of invasions and stuff. so we know families move um uh, in extenuating circumstances and, and by and large you could sort of separate some of them anyway uh, some families in the area will associate with those um uh, we'll try to sort of, you know, uh, intermingle with them. So a good one is the plantations of Ulster, um, which is often throws a lot of confusion into people where, you know, you can have Campbell's and um, McDonald's sort of coming into Ulster. Um, but at the same time, we have Irish families starting then to adopt the surname Campbell, you know, and around Armagh and stuff, because it sounds very similar to their Gaelic name. Um, you know, it's to, maybe to some families may have used it to avoid uh, prejudice or, you know, religious because of religious and all the other turmoils, you know, in, the, in that time period. But regardless for why they did it, we know it happened. So, you know, you've probably got Campbell's in America right now who are sort of like, well, my family came across, must have come across with the plantation, settled in Ireland, and then have gone across to America. And actually what we may find is that they just, Campbell's moved into an area with an Irish family and they took the name Campbell because it sounded very similar to their old Irish name, which I cannot pronounce, but <laughs> you know, uh, but it is very similar to Campbell. Um, and we have the same with Hamill as well. That's a very common one that uh, uh, Irish people adopted because um, it's very similar to 
uh, another uh, Hamel, uh, and uh, obviously we know they came across with the plantations too. So yeah, there are uh, anomalies to that sort of idea of thinking, but by and large we can sort of separate most of it because it's uh, it happens in big blocks. So it's it's you can sort of John Grenham is another good website to look at. Um, I'm just trying to find is uh, he's he's another great sort of uh, he does a lot of history on surnames and I, I don't know if he does um, Scottish. I can't. Uh, but it's Irish ancestors. So it's, it is Irish. Sorry. But anyone uh, uh, Irish ancestors by John Granaham. He's a good website uh, to look at if you're wanting to sort of get some basic information on um, where a clan sort of founded and, you know, stuff like that. So, Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and a hot, hot map with a wee hot spots and stuff. So well, that's, that's great. And yeah, I, and actually that wasn't so much on my radar. That's, that's, I appreciate you sharing that with us that a lot of the Ulster more native though, more native Irish were adopting some of these plantation um, people coming from Scotland or, or other parts of the UK um here's a, a question and, and actually i told you my connection to the whole scottish clan scene the thing that got me way into it and interested was that the, the mcfarlands actually my mcfarland line were ulster scots they were mm. they were they were, had settled in tyrone is that is that how you say it yep. tyrone or because that when i first uh, started saying, uh, go ahead uh, yeah like tyrone yeah yeah like tur it's gonna tie it's tur yeah Rome, like you know, i think tur. when i was first getting into this like back, clear back when i was in college and i was working for a company called icon doing their customer service and and a guy who i think he's living here in the u.s but he was from northern ireland and and i said yeah i've got the answers are from tyrone and he's like he he kindly <laughs> Kindly corrected me. I'm still going through that today. I'm still like, hey, you don't actually, it's not Sinclair, it's Sinclair and it's McLean. It's never McLean. And it's, I, I'll, I'll, but I kindly, I, cause a lot of these things I've only read, I've ever only ever read them. But so, yeah. So anyway, this, so this line, and I think, I suspect it was during the, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms or the Scottish Civil War. They were, I think they sided with Montrose and the, the Royalist side. And, that it, we know like that didn't go very well, I think. <laughs> I mean, it did for a so, while. <laughs> yeah, I mean that the plantations um, sort of we, we have private plantations. You know, the McDonalds were already well settled in yeah. Northern Ulster and Antrim, um, and they would have brought across Kin and Kith yes. and you know all that. And, uh, so you know, and then um, we had the private plantations, and then so all through the sort of. Um, 16th and 17th century but then we also had um a lot more coming across uh for uh the factory work um we, linen was uh, vastly produced in sort of belfast and uh all parts of northern ireland actually um and we brought in more people uh into northern ireland from scotland to man the factories um so yeah there was a lot of lot of movement um and some families say my uh sister is in the process of um Marrying our uh, husband from New Zealand, he's a Wallace, and his oh. family were Ulster Scots from Antrim, oh. and I managed to trace his line back to Galloway, actually. Oh, um, really? Yeah, so uh, I because he kept telling me he was Irish, and I I was like, no, you're Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a family one, but I know uh, we've got um, probably. I think I heard you say on a podcast you also have Boyd ancestry. Yeah. And my wife is a Boyd, or was oh, a Boyd. Really? Until she was yes. So, um, yeah, so she's, uh, so my children obviously have uh, Boyd ancestry. Um, so I unfortunately don't know my um, sort of Scottish ancestry. Um, it's happened. My tree isn't very in depth. Um, so I uh, I just know I have it from location and genetics and stuff like that. Uh, it would be a bit weird if I didn't have some sort of yeah. Scottish ancestry being from Northern Ireland. Um, but uh, I, I have some links to the shores, but I think they might be the English branch. I'm yet to, 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 to delve deep, but I would love would love nothing more to be a shore. A wee Macduff descended from, you know, the, the <laughs> Kings of Scotland that way, yeah. the proper line. <laughs> yeah, the proper line, I love it. Yeah, have you read, have you read John Bannerman's uh, work on 
the Macduffs of Fife? I have not. Um, I tend to, although I would say I spend a lot of my life Wikipedia and stuff like that, you know, just generalizing sort of uh, good information just to sort of yeah. pass the time. Um, I tend to leave these scholarly sources to when I'm doing research on the specific subject um, because I get sidetracked so easily that if I do read something, I have to then work on that product. And then other projects get put to the side. So. I'm going to jump on your side there and defend you with the Wikipedia thing. Wikipedia gets a lot of hate, but it is a really good platform to just get some general knowledge on something. And if you're going to yeah. write a paper on it, you can dive into the more scholarly sources. But to just get tuned up on something the way there's so many hyperlinks, so you can like, who's that? And you jump over and take a quick look at well, who that was I, and jump back. I think it's way useful. I would say that a lot of my friends who are in Irish medieval history, um, who are scholars and historians, a lot of them do defend Wikipedia too, in the sense that a lot of um, academics do edit the pages on Wikipedia. And they do often keep an eye on those pages and sort of keep them scholarly. But what I love about Wikipedia, like say, it's a good skimming source. It's a good place to get a, your first <laughs> footprint on what you're looking at. Um, yes. it, it's not really where you need to base any ideas or theories or anything, but it's a good place to just start on a topic. And also is the source bar at the bottom is such a great place to gain sort of uh, an idea on where you should be looking for sort of academic sources. Um, a lot of, it's a lot of good links that I've got from those sort of pages. So like I say, it's, it's not, it's never my, my backup to any argument, but it's always my entrance to any delving into any subject. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, those, like you said, those re that reference section at the bottom, some of those articles on Wikipedia are very well cited. And that has been a frequent source. I've often found very scholarly things out of that. And some of them are linked to a PDF written by an actual scholar and you can download it and you can mark it up. And no, I've, I've loved that, uh, that aspect of, of Wikipedia. Um, so we've, let's see, to kind of see where we've gone. We're coming up on, I think since I pressed record, we're not quite two hours, but we're, we're moving on it. Right. We've covered uh, uh, earlier. Hey, we, Go ahead. No, it's just a, yeah, I think we've covered sort of where we kind of wanted to, unless um, unless you think there's any more sort of uh, information maybe on the, the gallow glass or, oh yeah, you kind of wanted to touch if, if it's, if we haven't broken away from the topic too much, um, is the, the way the McSweeney's sort of integrated into Yes, culture. and by default yeah. of the McSweeney's, maybe any other. Uh, my my question here, and I think maybe one of the, uh, like I said, I think the video that really dialed me in on your your YouTube channel was the comparison and contrast between Irish and Scottish clans, and and I think maybe one of the great values that you bring to this conversation is you've studied Ireland way more, and I'm very interested in it. Like we said earlier, you only got so much time to study stuff, mm. and and I would love. I would love, love, love to start a whole new podcast just on Irish clans. There is, and maybe that's in your future, but I know you said you've only got so no, much time no, to and... I, I give you, I give you full, full, uh, <laughs> you run with that. And if you want a hand, I'm happy to help, but well, I, uh, I don't have like that. You would be a frequent person I reached out to. I'd, I'd be happy to, but I don't think I'd like to, like I said, I just did not have the time for another project where I had to edit and sort of sure. stuff like that. So well, I don't even ask um, my yeah, audience. I don't uh, edit very much. I, I might yeah. <laughs> grab something really quick or if one of my kids comes running in screaming or something like that, I'll cut that out. But other than that, it's pretty well record. Slap some yeah. music on either end of it and toss it on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well even even that i'm happy to i'll, I'll happily assist but uh, i wouldn't be able to be much use in the uh in the editing side but um the uh yeah i give you free license so you're not stepping on any uh toes so for... <laughs> good good well so um, not, not yeah, tell I us about this one. interaction between irish yeah. and scottish clans and you you do have the gala glass movement and at a time period at the early formation time period of a lot of the clans in Scotland as we would recognize them today and then forward well into 
those those individual clan histories and you see them coming down and interacting with Irish clans. Um, can you talk to us about Irish clans versus Scottish clans, how they were set up, how they were similar, the, the integration between them as these Gala Glass clans are coming down and, and establishing themselves in Ireland, what that landscape socially would have looked like compared to where they were coming from. Can you talk to a little bit to, about that? Well, see, um... Like I said, we sort of touched on the sort of early formations, like you said. Um, when the Galagas are sort of coming into Ireland in the 13th century, we have effectively a common, common enemy, you know, the English, you know, Normans uh, are, are sort of in. So that's changed the landscape as well, much like when the Vikings, the co common enemies tend to sort of form these wee bursts of nationalism and this, a sense of identity. So um, there is a bit of more of a, you know, homogenous idea on how certain things should be wrong because uh, at the same time you're fighting this kind of an enemy that's got a different system, that's got a primogenitor, it's got a very strict rule on, um, you know, how, how families are meant to inherit. Uh, but by and large, the Gaelic sort of societies remained the same small family groups led by larger family groups led by larger family groups um, and all of them sort of working in conjunction to make sure that the wider sort of chain area works effectively while jostling against other people Scotland exactly the same you've got these the high court the score the court of Scotland sort of uh, you know thanks to David obviously being uh, fostered into England and uh, not just him it happens with earlier kingdoms too but we see this sort of like Norman feudalism um, forming there um, and it's sort of being met at the same sort of push with the Highlands the Highlands are sort of doing the same thing they're like you've said succession editing family trees but they're by and large at a local level maintaining the same sort of king group um distribution of land, distribution of wealth um, amongst sort of kin and making sure that people don't tend to really fall out in the fringes um, unless they're exiled from certain classes. So when those groups are coming across to Ireland, now bear in mind that Sweeney's could be classed as maybe one of the exceptions in the fact that they claim to be descent from the uh, Kennel Call, um, an Irish group, and they move into the specific area where the Kennel Call are from, uh, which is the O'Donnell territory of Donegal, which is on the northwest of uh, Ireland. So they just happened to move into the very area that they claim to be from. Um, and the reason they do this is they have a, um, an, a sort of a links there anyway from Fosteridge. They had previously fostered, fostered an O'Donnell. Um, and so they've gone across and settled in this land and very quickly they're given land, they're given title, they're adopted into these. I guess the best example would be uh, most of your uh, listeners would be aware of the McDonald's and their, um, oh, what's the the groups, the families, the, where they all sort of meet up and they're the given Council title. Council of the Isles. Council of the Isles, thank you very much. I don't know why that skipped my head. Um, yes, so they're... Uh, they're very much integrated. That's how the clan system kind of, that is actually the McDonald's version of, you know, the clan system in effect. That is their way of a, that's, that was them re, part of their re um, you know, their, uh, what I just mentioned earlier. So they're a Gaelic revival. Um, it, it can't, this stemmed from that. Um, it's a rather crude attempt of it, you know, because at the end, at the same time, they're not really embedded in it. Um, but, so the McSweeney's would be aware of that system. They were very much in the influence of the Council of the Isles in that area. Um, so when they've come across, they've very quickly been adopted into the O'Donnell's sort of Council of the Isles, as it were, the king, the clan system. Um, what I has always sort of legitimised the argument for me that they are of Irish descent or Gaelic descent um, is that they are accepted very quickly into that. No other clan, no other, no other Gallo Glass clan kind of ends up there in that sort of situation. The McSheehy's do end own land in Monster. The Are you McDonald's talking about would, integrated to that level? That level, yeah. Okay. They would own land. They were even when when they were given land 
in Donegal to O'Connell, they were then invading neighbours and taking their land. You know, um, so which is, you know, they, these are king groups related to the King O'Connell. So they're they're basically uh, expanding their own power base at the expense of the person who's just give them land effectively or you know so even though they're not doing anything about it because maybe it's done with a bit of a you know at the end of the you know it's politics so maybe the O'Donnells are kind of not really that bothered by it it's, um, but it just sort of to me legitimizes the argument that they definitely see themselves as related whether they are or not they definitely both sides agree have come to the terms that we are related um, you don't see it with anyone else. The McDonald's, um, although they would be constables of like Ulster and, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the under the O'Neills, uh, they'd be constables in uh, um, over, under the O'Connors. Um, they don't ever get to that position. And then they eventually a McDonald branch will settle in um, Leinster um, and uh, have a wee bit of a kingdom of its own, a mini sort of, you know, uh, tour uh, of its own. Um, but it doesn't integrate into the politics the same way. It, it becomes its own entity, which is any power base can do with a, with armed troops like that. But it doesn't become assimilated into um, the, the more local politics that the McSweeney's do. So it's it, they are an anomaly um, in that sort of aspect. Um, but it just shows that the, by and large, they were most Gallo Glass captains were given land, and they were you know, very basic level of of feudalism in the sense that they would be at the bottom of the pile. You know, you've earned your keep, you've got your, you know, you can have your land, you can have your five villages to, to pay your uh, rent with or whatever, but um, you're not going to be voting on big issues. You're not going to be uh, in succession talks or anything, you know. Where so the it's, were at that level. Yeah, the Muslims were a very high level and very quickly, which again, you would think that other families related to the King of Connells, like the Gallaghers, the O'Doherty's, I mean, the O'Doherty's actually ruled to O'Connell at one stage very briefly, but so they would then see themselves as very important in the discussion with anything that would happen in that area. And they don't seem to challenge the McSweeney's um, in whatever they're doing. So it, it, at no point does it seem like... Um, it's an outsider coming into, uh, but the fact that they're able to do it very quickly as well shows that there is definite similarities between the two countries as well. They're not countries at the time, but two uh, regional areas um, that they can just sort of straight in, you know, off the back of running away from England, um, yeah. assimilate straight. Well, I know they lost out in Napdale to like a bunch of their territories in the 1260s to the the Stuarts who were just across mm. in that Renfrewshire area. And then the, the Stuarts, like you pre pre like you mentioned earlier, pre picking the wrong side or the losing side in the Scottish Wars of Independence, they were already starting to lose out to the Stuarts who yeah. established themselves as kind of like a bulwark against this Hebridean world there. But and, and it's interesting. I was thinking as you're talking about how successful the McSweeney's were in this and the level uh, they. So and I didn't understand that before you just explained that that they that they were like the top tier. Like there was tiers within Galaglass and on on a lower level on a bottom tier, any old any old family was handing over their big strapping boys to go earn a few bucks or maybe better maybe do better than that but um but then all the way up and so they'd go in there and they'd fight and but the top of the pile of mcsweeney's and i didn't know that there's that different levels by thinking about different factors that would go into that and i'm looking i'm still looking at my named public profiler map here that we used a minute ago the mix where the mcsweeney's held territory in scotland was very immediately across the channel from ireland so geographically mm. And maybe we, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't speak for anybody else, but have created false boundaries, even though I, the, I intellectually, I understand that the high to a seafaring people that high that the, the, those waters are just a highway to them. With that in consideration. That's all part of the same world that where they ended up settling in Ireland was not a different country, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then where they were just coming from, they were just like it'd be like in the states, just moving to a different state almost. Uh, uh, do you know what? I'd be honest. I'm not joking when I say I'm pretty sure. Um, when I 
I can see Scotland. And <laughs> I like I said, if I grew enough, or if I did a couple of weights for a week or two, I'm not even getting I could probably throw a stone at it. There, I think it's only 12 mile. Yeah. Um, between you know the, our two closest points, um, which is is nothing. It really yeah. is nothing. nothing. The, the fact that you can see it is 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 more than ever. Because if you can see it, you're gonna go. People are gonna go. What's over there? And especially in early, you know, in earlier periods, they're gonna right. go. What is that? What is that? You know, uh, you don't need that much seafaring equipment on a clear day to do twelve mile. Um, and, and in fact, I think we're drifting apart. So. Give it a thousand years ago, we were probably only about you know ten or eleven miles. So, um, <laughs> every mile counts. But what I'm saying is, is that uh, it was it was just as it was a highway. Um, uh, just as much. there were periods where it became a bit of a boundary um, for uh, for other reasons. But by and large, it, it was it was no great feat. Um, no 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 McSweeney. Proto McSweeney and the Bronzies was getting a pat on the back for for travelling it because it wasn't seen as a great <laughs> great expedition. <laughs> it was no, it was no Leif Eric Center. Yeah, <laughs> I can think of it right here in the valley that I live in. So, so I'm I'm in the the very northern Utah, and in the the valley, the mountain valley that I live in, twelve miles away, I I can see Idaho from here. Yeah, it's a completely different state, but the top, I don't know, third of the valley I live in is actually in Idaho. Right. And and there is a highway and I can just drive up and I can see and the, my hometown is not in this valley. It's it's in just over the this mountain range and then a little farther north. But I can see the peaks from here that I saw going to high school. Yeah, like the same peak. I can see it from here. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was like I say it was uh, people look at a very it's a two D map uh, you know and you're looking yes. down on it and you see this great big and yeah the Irish Sea can be very you know it's got some pretty bad weather um but those two points really are very very close together um and which like I say leads very much into an example of so when Edwin uh, Campbell sort of explained his earlier origin routes which we've already gone over um. It doesn't make it seem like it's not a million miles apart, so it's not completely to be ignored. Um, at the same time, uh, like I say, there are sort of uh, the Viking era, heav heavily pirated regions, stuff like that, which would uh, countenance the continuance of uh, uh, migrations between the two all the time. But uh, yeah, it, so it made sense. It made sense for them to go that way, the McSweeney's and, and all Gallo Glass, especially with the war con continuous warfare, the way Ireland was structured. Um, but it's just the McSweeney's to be able to establish themselves the way they did um, uh, compared to their other competitors. Now, I don't know, like, I know the McSweeney's did sort of branch off into other sort of uh, families and went the other direction. Some smaller branches went and joined, you know, to the east. Um, whether the fact that the whole of the McSweeney sort of hierarchy were entirely invested into that maneuver, whereas the Mackays or the uh, McCabe's or the McDonald's were cadet branches going down there you know they it's not their entire sort of life savings being dragged with them it's you know it's um it, it's sort of branches of them that you know the the clan as a whole isn't entirely wholly invested in that uh, the outcome so they don't get the full return that the McSweeney's got who were do or die you know if yeah. they didn't get in the, there was nowhere for them to go um so that could obviously play a part uh, but you know it's uh, it's definitely one worth thinking about. But uh, like I say, uh, another good family is Mac McDonald's. They like I say they got their own wee bit of land, and they were like border marchers um, in Leinster, and sort of played the O'Moores, the Fitzgeralds, and the O'Tools, and the McMurrs against each other, and sort of got a wee <laughs> bit into politics, but nowhere near to the level the McSweeney's did. Well, it's that's that's really interesting. That now, um, I just maybe one last question. I want to be respectful of your time, like Mike. Honestly, like with somebody else who loves the subject as much as I do, <laughs> and and on on a lot of areas has studied this to a much greater depth than I have. 
I, I really could do this all day, but in respect for your time, if I could just ask you another question about, so there's, and you, you have mentioned this in one of your videos, there's a difference between gallo glass and red shanks. Or is uh, there? Yeah. Or is there? Go ahead. I mean, they, they kind of work the same way in the sense of there are mercenaries coming in. But I mean, but by this stage, by the time the gallo glass or sort of the red shanks are in existence are coming in, the gallo glass are not really traveling to Ireland. They're already in Ireland. They're settled in Ireland. In fact, there's arguments that some of them are now of Irish descent in the sense of because Irish the continuation of Gallo Glass whittled down the, the amount of men that these families had to fight. So they were bringing in, um, fostering and adopting Irish children. You know, so the lines between being a Scottishman and an Irishman and a, the, the Gallo Glass in this sort of uh, context are so blurred. You know, um, the only thing really that got them linking them to Scotland for the most part is a surname, a shared surname but they're not involved in each other's business anymore. That They've gone off and done their own thing. Um, so it, the Red Shanks are like a new wave with new technology. Um, <coughs> so the, the Elizabeth is obviously kind of like also very against Gallo Glass. You know, they, they are the root of a cause of problem that every time the Irish rebel, this is where they get the pool of their troops that cause the most harm to English interests in Ireland. Um, so there's a, there's a, obviously religious aspects involved in that too. So the the red shanks are really just the new gallo glass. They work the same way, exactly the same way, 300 years later with the newest technology, with maybe a new religious outlook, a new, so that they're just the, the, the new boys on the block but they're like every other boy band, you know, they just, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it, it's, it, there's not really, the only difference is uh, like the idea is just a repeat of the same ideas I'm for. They've just got the new equipment, got the new religious outlook, uh, got, but they've got the same ideas. Um, they're, they, they're structured the same way uh, in battalions, um, you know, that they're just, that they are effectively the same thing. So just like Galaglass two, yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, the Galaglass two, point, exactly. Because it's the seasonal? same family. Were they more less permanent, more seasonal, or were they every bit as permanent? So the Galaglass at the very start, with the exception of the McSweeney's and their exceptional circumstance, were the same. They were seasonal too. Um, it, it, it was only after coming across for a couple of seasons that they started to establish themselves in these groups and in these areas and start asking for land instead of money. And, you know, um, so th these are the, the Red Shanks did the exact same thing. They were seasonal, but then we know that there are families here descended from Red Shank settlers and stuff. So, and it's the same families, the Campbells are another Red Shank family. You know, it, it's the same families doing the same thing they've always done. They just had a wee bit of a break, you know? <laughs> that is so interesting. So it was mostly the same kindreds that are sending these guys over. Yeah, and actually end up fighting off fighting the same kindred that had left their main lines three hundred years before. You know, because they've 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 adopted to the way the Scottish political system and religious system had changed in that time period, and the Gallagher have become more gale sized because they're, they're in Ireland and they're they're under that one. And like say, so you would have you would maybe have you know um, McDonald you have McDonald against McDonald on the battlefield, um, you know. One's in Gallo Glass, and one, you know, with his chain mail, and the other ones. Um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not really sure what to name the outfits, but more padded than than uh, than heavy chain mail. But yeah, I know, what you're yeah, talking but about, distant but... kin, distant kin. So it's uh, you know, I noticed the pattern with what you're saying, especially when you talk about the Scandinavian influence. Doesn't that does that not mirror? the exact pattern that the Vikings went through at the very early stages, they're coming is very seasonal and they're not, mm. they're not taking a lot of territory. They're hitting and running, they're raiding, they're hitting soft targets and they might, they might hang out. They might establish a little overwinter camp nearby on some Island and hole up for the winter, but it's not, but it's later on that they become, no, we're here to stay. We're a thing. Now you've got to deal with us. 
it follows a very similar pattern. Human history does. It, there's very few instances of um, uh, Scottish history is filled with uh, the Vikings came and wiped out this entire island, and you know all these. You know the the Vikings came and wiped out this entire town, or the English came, or you know yeah. yada yada. Uh, history is filled of these stories. Uh, this clan was entirely wiped out, and it never happens like that. There's not a there's, no. there would be very few instances where an entire village island clan would be wiped out in its entirety yes the the way that we they viewed themselves at the time of maybe being the hot shots of the area the leaders um the village could have been a thriving town um the island could have been a thriving island and then it's been reduced down to a different level uh, that you know stepped down yeah. but then they're never no one's ever completely eradicated um so uh yeah these by and that is human sort of history or right from the start. Um, yes, but so this continuation is happening here in the early medieval period. They're they're, they're new fat they're going off on these uh adventures for wealth, glory, fame. Um and then they're if you're successful at it enough times in a specific area, you think to yourself, well what's the point of going back? You know, I may as well just stay here and do it continuously. I'm missing out half half the time I'm away in the boat instead of not here. That's that's you know a third of my journeys. You know a third of my conquest is you know in a boat. I could just up my revenue by staying here. Plus land, you know, um, is always uh is always wanted. So, yeah. uh, and and all, all you notice these sort of groups are always successful in their initial um probing uh, you know expeditions. So the Vikings very successful for the first sort of, you know, 100 years. The Gallo Glass, very successful for the first couple of 100 years. It's always the successful groups that sort of, um, you know, you get a few, you know, the Berbers who were collecting slaves in the, you know, in the later centuries, you know, none of them tried to settle. You know, it's a, it, because uh, people realise that, that they can't, obviously, for various reasons. But, yeah, it's always the successful groups coming in, continuing next group, next group, next group. And it goes back hundreds of thousands of years, I'm sure. I don't know. I don't know how long it goes back, but it goes back, it goes back as far as human history anyway. <laughs> yeah, I I have seen that in certain clan histories where they'll talk about a battle and like, oh yeah, the whole fighting strength of this clan was wiped out. And then like 20 years later, you see him in a battle again. You're like, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that the whole clan wasn't wiped out. <laughs> now, maybe yeah. whoever the chief had with him at the time, maybe he, maybe it was a raid. It wasn't like a full yeah. battle and the numbers were overstated and maybe had like 60 dudes and maybe most of them died, but he's got yeah. like 300 more. Mm. <laughs> that he can have from. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's uh, just as much as storytelling, you know, this um, yeah. uh, emphasis on these points that sort of make it sound like how bloody and it, it was. And maybe in a political stance, it was maybe, you know, this specific line was, um, was more important than that the next line that took over and any survivor of that specific line can be like, oh, our clan was wiped out, you know, and because it's, it's really, he's lost his position as a, you know, so there's always these wee, uh, human elements in in, the, in our stories that sort of uh, get forgotten. And I'm sure, but like I say, it's, it's, we have the same stories with the Vikings in the Isles as well. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure I read many a times and the island was all the men were killed on this island and the vikings took over and, you know and it just it, it it never works like that at the end of the day the vikings even if they did want to wipe out an entire island they're going to need people to farm the land they're going to need people to do all the jobs they don't want to do you know so it's not all the men <laughs> yeah, no, i agree no that's good and you explain that very well that the uh and and, they, and you I think I think you contributed the how I had that in my head with Red Shanks versus Galaglass. You definitely deepened my understanding of of that relationship there, and I think it was very helpful. I think this whole conversation has been way helpful for my audience. I think they'll love it. We did spend a chunk of time a little earlier, you know, in those 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 um between post you know immediately post Roman clear up until you know eleven hundred maybe in that area, and I don't. But I do think there's value in that because these these clans, whether Irish or Scottish, are not just popping into place out of nowhere on the scene. I think it's important to understand that earlier 
history and then then we can move in and we've established out those foundations in fact lately i've thought about maybe revisiting some of my very first episodes that i ever did talking about the different ethnic groups that largely were the biggest contributors to the clans of scotland your your gales of dalriada your britons of strathclyde your angles of northumbria the picts the vikings and then later the normans um and, and maybe just doing a better job of that because i do think it bears heavily on your understanding of then that later time periods yeah it, it all sort of interconnects um and i'm the same i look back on my sort of stuff and think i oh, maybe should clear that up a wee bit better um so my dad always told me that if you're going to make a video or do a lecture or whatever have a point and that stick to that point and i find it very hard sometimes to stick to a specific point because i get so sidetracked as many of your listeners will now attest to uh, how easy it is for me to go off on these wee alleyways um but always have a point and stick to that point and um so i'm on the same i'm thinking of going back and just sort of re re solidifying my stance on certain things and um you know why i think that way um rather than just going for four hours like i noticed that a lot of my videos it's uh 20 minutes of introduction and then the last five minutes are actually what i wanted to do the video about <laughs> yeah well I, that was one of my especially my first couple of years of doing this that was one of the biggest corrections that i heard from people was like dude pick a pick a topic and stay on it like you're all over the place <laughs> and i was like okay um, they're gonna be like oh you're back at it clint you're I back know. at it <laughs> well yeah <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we can do it like a concise summary of what we've talked about. Maybe as I, because I'll re probably record a separate intro to all this and say, hey, look, here's what we're going to talk about. Because it does, I think that there is, there is a common thread weaving throughout it all. And if you can set that expectation at the very beginning, then mm -hmm. they'll, they'll kind of understand that moving forward. But going back, we've talked about some of the foundational uh, elements of both Irish and Scottish clans, some of the records that were involved, how those histories developed and then we moved into this relationship and this back and forth i think the biggest back and forth between ireland and scotland when you're thinking of clans and specific kindreds is is that gala glass back and forth and to understand where those gala glass come from those going back to origins you got this viking element scandinavian element the gales of ireland and scotland and seeing how this all group comes together and then watching that back and forth and understanding that these aren't two completely separate worlds and that uh, these people, when these Scottish kindreds come down and settle in Ireland, they're not settling in a foreign land. Mm. Yeah, the, I imagine there were accent differences, but they can speak with each other back and forth, especially the, the Northern. I don't know how different, because my understanding of the Gaeltacht, whether it's Irish or Scottish, is that it's a spectrum. So right across from Southwest Scotland and Northern Ireland, very similar Strathnaver versus Cork, maybe <laughs> much different. Is that is that uh, accurate? Um, the, the sort of dialects of of Gaelic uh, are um, not as in depth as Gaelic and Gaelic is today. Uh, you know. So, uh, although a Gaelic speaker and a Gaelic speaker may be able to understand a general conversation um, or the, the where the conversation's going by certain words, but they're just saying a certain word funny, but they can still kind of get it. Um, the dialects in Ireland were um, not that far apart. Um, in fact, I would say it would be no different to uh, an Idaho man speaking to an Alaskan you know, uh, American or Hawaiian American, there's going to be certain words they throw in that you're like, okay, or, you know, th that's not how you pronounce that. But um, I suppose actually the best example would be for American Canadian, you know, um, you see, or British, even now, you know, Irish and, and American. Yeah. There's certain certain things that, you know, way people say certain things or, um, you know, but that's, that's the difference. It's not really that different. Um, but uh, throughout the entire Ireland, we can sort of kind of get on, but it's just sort of you can just tell. <laughs> I'm sure it's even a, a state level. You you've got boys from maybe East Idaho or West Idaho, and you're just like, oh, he's from East Idaho. Well, I can tell him my loss. There's there's probably I for sure for sure. So I just took a trip to New York, and it wasn't New mm. York City. 
it was yep. Buffalo, but for sure people, wherever you are in New York, if you're talking to people who they're not from somewhere else, they're, they're native of that. Absolutely. There is like, we wouldn't say it like that, but there's yeah. no problem. We could sit down and like, just like the, me and you right now and have just this mm -hmm. wonderful conversation. And that's kind of how I picture a McSween or a uh, McDougal coming down into Northern Ireland or even farther. Yeah, there mm -hmm. might have been some, a few things they say differently, but there's not a completely different world. Their societal structure set up pretty similar. They have similar roots. The farther back in time you go, the closer those, those divergences get until, uh, just really interesting to hear that from an, with more of an Irish element than, than what my audience is used to hearing. And mm. so thank you so much for a contributing that. That's, that was, that was actually one of the words that you said different. You said contributed, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you contributed much yeah. <laughs> to my audience to, today. So I thank you so much for spending all this time with me. And I mean, really, I think the two of us on this subject, could we just go on and on and on, but I appreciate you taking some time, especially where it, we wanted to do it last weekend. It didn't quite work out more on my end than on your end, but, but, uh, yeah, it's just been a really uh, it's been a pleasure to to speak with you about this, Mike. No, thanks very much, Clint, and uh, same to your audience. Thanks very much for having me, and I hope I've uh, not waffled on too much. But uh, thanks very much. Well, guys, check out Clans and Dynasties on YouTube, and uh, and just he's got he's got quite a bit of content on there. I think you'll if you haven't already been on there, I think you'll like to explore. So, all right, thanks, Mike. Thanks. Very much. thanks.